Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pesky Podcast family. So don't forget, I'd like to have you take some time to subscribe to our podcast. Um, drop me an email at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Tell us about the show. We're really glad you're here. And today's guest is Charles Parker. He's the owner of Parker Wildlife Control and Nuco Pro Software, and he's from Louisiana. So we're going to have a little Southern theme here today. We're going to talk about controlling some Southern animals like armadillo and nutria and Muscovy ducks. So those of us in the North don't have some of those problems, although nutria are up in Washington State and Oregon, and they think they got eradicated out of Maryland or Delaware, somewhere in there. But uh, sometimes the nutria come a little farther North, but definitely Muscovy ducks and armadillo, those are definitely in the Southern tier of the United States. So we're really glad to have you on board here, Charles. Thanks. Welcome to the podcast. Nice. Thanks. Thanks. Uh for having me on. All right, tell us a little about yourself. So my name is Charles Parker. I have a company here in uh, New Orleans called Parker Wildlife Control. I've been doing this for about 20 years now. Um, I also uh, created a software called Nuco Pro, which stands for Nuisance Wildlife Control Operator. Um, that's basically, I built it to run my own business and then I decided to sell it as a software as a service so that other operators could do the same thing as me and be able to manage their company remotely. And so basically that allows my phone calls to go into a database and manage things and be able to look at the data over time as to like when the, the armadillo calls might come in through the year. You know, as, as a wildlife control guy, you kind of get a feel for when certain animals will become more prevalent and when those jobs start to pick up. But that's not always the same as what the actual data is. You know, we always try to say, oh, well, the, you know, we got to stop doing the bat jobs in May. So when do they actually start? Or when do they actually start dropping off? You know, because the type of bats that we deal with here in the South are, uh, some of them are migratory and some are not. So we have the Mexican free tail bat. And, you know, you have the two subspecies, Eastern and Western. And we have both here because some migrate out and some don't. And so, you know, like looking at all that data over time is really helpful. Well, interesting. Why don't you tell a bit more about your software? Is this a, a program that helps you schedule your, your day? Is it that sort of program or is it more yeah, of an incoming so, data program? So it's both. So, you know, phone calls are automatically logged into the software. Okay. So I have like basically a tracking number. And once the call connects, it records it and then uploads it to my, my database. And so from once I get the phone call, then I create a job and a customer from that. And then I can set a schedule and text all the jobs to uh, the, you know, the guys that work for me. And then they can do reports and add pictures to it and all that kind of thing. And you can do invoicing. It's not an accounting software, but you okay. can definitely send invoices and things like that. I always say when it comes to accounting, you should be using QuickBooks. Okay. Do you think they're ever going to integrate those two together or is that just too big of no. a project? Yeah, it's really, it's two different, two, you know, uniquely different and complicated things. I mean, QuickBooks, there's a reason that that software is so successful mm. and that it's so enormous. Um, it's just, it's a job into itself. And how large of a company should someone be before they start looking at your software? Is it someone just for a single man operation or do you need to be bigger Absolutely. than that? Yeah, no, okay. absolutely. If a single operator, you know, most of the, most of the people in this industry industry are single operators. Sometimes their wife will help them, mm -hmm. and they'll have a helper. And so, like being able to schedule jobs and sending them out to techs and things like that, that might be a bit much for a single operator. But at the same time, it's really good to have all that stuff on a schedule because then you can go back and look at that. Like I was saying, one of the biggest things that are underutilized things is the data that we all have yeah. as, as wildlife control operators. You know, it's really interesting to be able to look at my phone calls and I have like uh, statistics within the software. So right. you can look at national statistics where it doesn't identify anybody, but it just says how many bat calls are entered into the software, how many possum calls, how many skunk calls. And then you have company statistics. And it's really interesting looking at people from all over the country. You know, we've got, I've got people that use it all over the United States. So let's say somebody in Idaho 
um, they might have skunk calls, whereas I'm not going to really have any in Southern, you know, in the New Orleans area, south of the lake where I, where I work. And so, you know, his, his number one call might be voles and moles, whereas mine might be bats or mine might be possums. Okay. Um, which now, do, are, you, do you then use that information to govern your advertising program so that if you start seeing absolutely. data over time? That's a, that's a really, really good question. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll load all of my phone calls in, I'll separate it by species and I'll say, I want to look at all of my bat calls for 2019. I throw them all up on a Google map and then I can look at these neighborhoods and then I can target what neighborhoods I want to send advertising into. Because like I said, as if you've been doing this a long time, you start realizing, oh, I know I do a lot of bat work in this city. Hmm. I do bat work in this city. But when you go to use something like uh, every door direct mail marketing through the post service, okay. you need to know specific routes. And so being able to visually see what neighborhoods at you should be targeting because you know where those bats are now or where the calls are coming from, you can really do a much better targeting on your marketing. So, yes. Well, especially if you're using exclusion on bats, they're probably going to be moving down to a house in that same neighborhood because the habitat obviously is good and finding a weak spot there. And so you it's target. Not, yeah, it's not just, it really is more about looking at the types of construction. Okay. So like in certain areas of Baton Rouge, they've got a lot of single story homes. All right. And the bats in the, that area, they tend to go towards the garages on the house. Okay. Um, same thing, let's say out in uh, heading towards the east, uh, the city of Slidell, a lot of single story homes. So when you start looking at those neighborhoods and you say, well, here's a whole nother neighborhood with single story homes. I know in that area, that's where I should probably be targeting. Okay. And so you can actually track how your calls are coming in based on your advertising to see if you're getting a return on your investment. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. you know, you're, you're really looking at, um, you know, what you, you can easily see where your calls are coming from. Mm -hmm. So it'd be easy to track that. Yes. And how about uh, in terms of record keeping, I know another wildlife control operator really makes it a point to when he goes to a house, he's measuring everything. He's measuring the chimney flues and he's trying to upsell and cross sell a variety of things. And if the client doesn't order it at that particular moment, he has those records. I think he uses paper, but I mean, your software, if someone said, you know, two months later, well, you know, I've thought yeah. about it. I think I really do want that <laughs> chimney cap. Is that something where you go back into the software and you say, okay, he had a nine by nine and I know I need this type of flu to, flu cap well, to cover uh, that. Yeah, yeah. So being able, uh, another awesome thing is that sometimes people will call and you talk to them on the phone and you say, you know, a house like what you're describing to me, I could probably do that for about maybe, let's say, 875 right? Mm -hmm. And so a year later they call and they say, hey, is that price still good? And you're thinking to yourself, what in the heck did I tell them? <laughs> you know? And <laughs> you can go back and actually listen to that call again. Oh, but wow. you can also, you know, but you don't have to. You can write notes, which is what I do. Okay. You know, in the description of the phone call, right? Told the customer I thought it might be about eight seventy five, and that way you're kind of in the same range. I mean, it is what it is. If you get out there, if it's a five thousand dollar job, obviously you're not going to do it for eight seventy five. Sure, right, right, um, right. You know, at the same time, like, but and and then also uh, another great thing is um, keeping up with what you told people and then also what you charge them. So if their neighbor calls the following year, you don't know that sometimes these people are friends. And so yeah. you give them a price for 1500 bucks and they're like, well, my neighbor, you only charge them $1,200. Yeah. You know, yeah. why is it $300 for my house? Now you're on the defense. Right. But if you already know that, I mean, like I said, it is what it is, mm -hmm. but you know, some days, I mean, I don't know you, it, we're hu only human. I mean, yeah. if, if I had a huge bill due, and I'm looking at a job that's between 12 and 15 and, and my wife is saying, we need, you know, about a thousand dollars right now. And I'm thinking I better make it 1500, you know, and it's, that's, that's how things go. Sometimes it's yeah. not, you, you want to be as fair as you can with people though. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good point there. And so how, what's it cost? What's it cost for someone to sign up for this? Uh, it's uh $26 and 50 cents a month. Twenty six fifty a month. Okay. And what's that yeah. and what's that get them? That get them the full package or are you on a tiered system? 
Um, that's pretty much everything. The only thing it does not get them is the automatic call recording. Okay. So because that is a separate, so there's a tracking number involved and a third party mm -hmm. that you, you're paying by the minute. Now it's like two tenths of a cent, maybe, you know, or oh, 200. Yeah, it's like a minute. So it really, my calls, so I'm putting probably three to 500 phone calls a month through there. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be $20 more a month. Oh, that's not bad. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so just looking, I, I'm really trying to work on the pricing, but, you know, I'm not going to eat that, obviously, if yeah. if they're only paying twenty six fifty a month to start with. Now, does that, tr when they per purchase that additional item, does that, do they transcribe that phone call into text or is that just recording it just as a sound WAV file or something? I, it, it's a WAV file. Mm -hmm. I have, I can do transcription. I just have not coded it yet. I gotcha. So you thought we have another feature coming down the road, probably. <laughs> when do you think yeah. that's going to hit the road? Uh, that'll be a while. I mean, it's not a priority at this time. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else coming down the road with the, with the software that you've had people asking you for that you're looking to code it in? Well, so some of the things are just minor tweaks to what we've already got going on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the a lot of stuff revolves around the mapping. So what's interesting is if you've got a job with uh, that's, let's say, uh, I'm starting to integrate pest control into it, yep, yep. which is, you know, like I've always said, okay, this is a wildlife control software. Because when I first got into this, there was almost zero crossover. You had guys that did pest control and you had guys that did wildlife control. Yep. And more and more, we're seeing both now. The, it was always, it seemed like the pest control guys were trying to do wildlife control largely unsuccessfully but more and more i'm really starting to see a lot more pest control companies that are applying themselves you know they're going to NACOA training they're, they're really investing into training their personnel mm. and so you know it, they're getting better but i'm also starting to see wildlife control guys that are starting to cross over into pest control yeah and so i have had the request from some users saying hey you know we we're doing pest control now i need you to track my pesticides and i need you to I want to, you know, this customer is going to be on a, a monthly billing series, right? Quarterly, annual. And in fact, that's what I was working on right prior to coming on with you was adding in some map markers so that you can look at your jobs, your pest control jobs and know, looking at the map, the icon on the map that it is, let's say a vol job that is also a quarterly treatment or a monthly treatment. Um, or, you know, if it's ants or spiders or whatever. And so you can look at all these things, pull up your schedule for the day and then say, oh, you know what? There's a also a job that I should probably check nearby. So, and, and then you it, when you click on the icon, there's a map link so you can just go right there. So it kind of helps you stay on, on focus to what, you know, where your jobs are. Sure. It's really easy when you've got 50, 60 jobs going on to, totally forget about some rat mm -hmm. traps that you set in an attic you know and and customers it's amazing how they don't smell some of this stuff so. yes it is <laughs> i get up there and i'm like man this rat has been dead for at least a week you know and it's horrible up here there's flies you didn't smell that you know <laughs> so if, in terms of the software did some states require reporting of you know the number of animals that you've caught yes does the software does allow that, that to it does, so yes, it allows absolutely. you to export that. Very nice. Well, what's what's really nice about that is as you're out doing your jobs and you go out, you do a report and you say, you know, one squirrel caught. And so when you do that, at, at the end of the year, all you have to do is go into your animal report, select the date, print report. And it has everything broken down with, you know, the species, how many, the date. And so I've been working with different people in different states and, you know, I, you know, this, uh, the, the wildlife control industry, as far as regulation is scattered. Oh my right? gosh. So yeah. it's all over the place. It is. So one state has nothing. They, right. they could, it's the wild west. They don't care. Montana. Then another state. Yeah. Another state, man, they want to see everything. They want to not only know what you caught, where you caught it, when you caught it, they want to know what did you do with it and yep. where did you put it? Right. And also, was it a male or a female? Was it, uh, you know, uh, nursing? They, there's so many different, the you know, w the state requirements are all over the place. Yeah. So as users come on, then I'll tailor it. Um, so like one of them, 
I think in Tennessee, you have to list the release site. Oh, okay. Very you know, nice. Where, where you took it. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of, that's a gray area. I think a lot of wildlife control guys never want to get into. Yeah. Massachusetts, they required, of course, we couldn't release anything unless it was on site, had to be on the person's property. And of course, you don't have thousands of acres in Massachusetts. So it was either on property or it was dead. If it walked, if it was, if we carried it off the property, it had, it was never coming back because I told people. So there you had to actually record the person's, the owner's name, right? city, but then right. they had a little regulation that said that gave the client some protection that that if there was a FOIA request, they couldn't get the name of the owner. So all you had was right. the name of the owner, the locate the the city or town, and then what the animal was, and then what you did with it. Right. So, there, in, so in Louisiana, you've got codes like did you uh, trap and euthanize the animal? Uh, was it you know DOA dead on arrival? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things they say is relocate. And, you know, you know the, the definition of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if your listeners do, but so there's two words. There's relocate and yep. there's translocate. Right. So relocate, you're technically releasing it on site. Right. Translocate, you're moving it outside of its home range. So when what's funny is like I look at that reporting form and I think, what are you asking me? Because really, they mean to translocate. That's correct. Right? Yeah. You know, that, but yeah. they're using the improper term. And I yeah. think, you know, the state should probably correct that, but whatever. Yeah, it would be really, there was, uh, yeah, I got that, that was criticized by, uh, I think there was well, an article article in WCT that criticized that they said, oh, relocation's fine. We, sh we don't need to translocate. And so I think it was, uh, um, the guy I actually respected too wrote the piece, but I thought about responding back to him and I, I never did, but. Well, you know, it's funny because on the form it says release on site yeah, and then relocate. Yeah. Right? It really so, means I would think, yeah, yeah. it's like, well, yeah. so it's the same thing in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. I would, I actually think it's probably good to have three definitions on site relocate means within the home range. Cause sometimes like with a snake, the person doesn't want it in their backyard, but you know, if you take right. it another hundred feet right. or so, it's going to be fine, most likely. And then, you know, translocate when you're driving 20 miles outside and of dumping, the and you're dumping it right. somewhere, but absolutely. Well, that's right. pretty, that's pretty neat. So how long has the software been around? Well, I've been developing it now for about six years. Okay. And you know, I, when I first started doing this, literally I knew nothing. Um, I've self-taught, I've spent many nights, uh, crumbling paper repeatedly <laughs> uh i mean a lot i went through a lot of paper probably at least 10 bolts of paper you know um, yeah. and where i and i gave up several times but something inside me just would not let me quit and okay. so once i started actually getting it and understanding how to make now uh i feel like i'm very proficient with it so if uh, somebody calls me and says hey can it do this i'm like yeah give me about an hour it'll be ready you wow know, like, that's amazing. So I can make changes in the software super fast. Operating systems? Is it just Windows or do you, are you open for well, Mac too? Um, yes. So okay. we've had some limitations based on the browser. Okay. Um, because it is, it's technically not an app like on your phone. Okay. It's, it's what you call a web app. All right. So it's a web application, right? And so you would access it via a web browser. Gotcha. I've noticed that on Safari, which you'll find on iPads and Macs, right. um, every once in a while, there's an issue with it. Um, it might be something small, like you can't scroll. Okay. And what, sometimes it might be you can't scroll with one finger, but if you grab with two fingers, it'll scroll. Oh, no kidding. Right. It, right. And so that's because you've got different types of browsers that are on different types of devices, right? You've got a, a touchscreen laptop. You've got a touchscreen iPad. Technically, there are different browsers on those, even though it might be called Safari. Mm -hmm. So now, is there any uh, attempt? I mean, I'm kind of speculating here because I've never used the program myself. I, I I was out of the business before you 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 started doing this sort of work. Uh, for there's a lot of people starting to use uh, cellular phone trail cameras and those types of things. Is there ever right. an attempt to integrate being able to have someone rather than the person's being called 
directly or having an email directly to their cell phone or something where it would be routed through this program or is that something you that's know, just too hard to do? It, it would depend. So there's a uh, there's some cellular trail cams out there right now that if I could get a hold of one of their developers, I guarantee you I could make that happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, an API, if they if they just enabled an API to, to get to the back end of their database, yeah. that would be easy to do. Interesting. But um, it, you know, it's really depend on, I mean, you're talking about two different people, right? You've got the supplier of the cell phone camera and then right. you've got my software. They actually made their own software so that, you know, you can log in and get to your stuff. But if they create an API, it'd be much better. Interesting. So there's still a lot of room, a lot of room for growth in this industry to try to integrate all, all these technologies because time is the biggest challenge in this business, isn't it? I mean, you can't, it's hard to yeah. get labor. And if you can't get labor, you've got to figure out a way to do your job faster. To right. Make, so, make real you money. know, I looked at, I, I was looking at one of my uh, customers in Nuco Pro, another guy using the software. I was in his account this morning. We were going over some of an issue he was having. Um, and I look at his schedule today and I thought, my goodness, man, you, I mean, there's at least 25 stops in here. And he's only got a couple guys. And so I said, man, it's, this is a pretty full day. Huh? He's like, yeah, man, we're rocking and rolling. Um, there time is, time is super important. You know, if it's, but he's also integrating pest control. So some yeah. of it might be a, you know, 20 minute stop. Right. But I know myself, I've, I've got, uh, two i'd say seasonal helpers i guess what you'd call you know um, sure. working and when we get when i schedule a day i think to myself okay you got travel time between jobs you've got time on the job let's say you spend an hour and a half on that job and then you travel to the next net you're almost at a half a day with two jobs that's right right you know and then yep. if if anything comes up, right, the guy's <laughs> late for work that day or, mm -hmm. you know, there's a flat tire, you know, or you need to put brakes on. Now that whole day is shot, right. you know. So when you've got a bunch of J at times, scheduling is definitely a problem. Yeah, it's a real Always. it's a real challenge. I, I keep thinking about how do we help wildlife control operators to maximize their time? Because that's the one thing that really prevents them from making improving money either they raise prices or do stuff faster there's no other way well yeah i i learned that early on i said okay i look at the number of jobs that i can do in a year there's only so many hours in a day right so you know one a single operator in in a year say he does three to five hundred jobs and that's he's gonna be maxed out yeah so is he gonna do more jobs or charge more for the jobs he's doing right yeah. And that's, what you have to decide. And I, you know, I always tell people, Hey, I'm not in this to break even. Right. You know, that was right. never the goal. I mean, I, I do want to survive, but sure. I mean, just to break even, man, yeah. what's the point in that? You the know? Point. Well. So where do they uh, learn more about your product? Do you have a website that you want to sure. present it's out there? Uh, Nucopro.com. Nucopro.com. Yeah. N-W-C-O-C-R-O. I mean, C <laughs> right. N W C O P R O. Correct. Dot com. Okay. Yeah, Nucopro.com. All right. Well, check it out, everyone. Nucopro.com. N W C O P R O.com. Nucopro.com. And check out Charles Parker's uh, software out there and see if it's going to be something that's going to work for your, for your company. Well, why don't we uh, switch up a little bit and let's talk about some southern animals, some southern critters that you have to deal with, um, okay. like armadillo or Muscovy ducks or nutria. Is it nutria uh, or nutria? I call it nutria. Nutria. Okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're saying nutria. Nutria. Uh, yeah, it's got to roll off a little easier. Than yeah. That. All right. Nutria. Gotcha. Nutria. All, all right. right. So um, uh, tell us about some of your experiences with, let's start with Muscovy ducks. I guess you said that'd be pretty okay. quick. Yeah, yeah. So Muscovy ducks, I mean, the, we don't get a lot of calls for that around here, but they do. We've got a large park where they congregate uh, and they seem to be I don't I don't know where they came from. Honestly, I moved to New Orleans in 1989 and I do not recall Muscovy ducks wandering around out on the main highway. Mm. Don't recall that. But here recently, like you were seeing them in parking lots at the uh, 
at, at fast food places because you know especially with the tables outside yeah. uh, the, the ducks are real quick to walk up yeah you got a french fry you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you know people are like oh look at the duck you know but then what happens is pretty soon you get 10 15 ducks hanging around yeah. And they're sleeping there. They're pooping there. There's feathers Gosh. everywhere. And then people are like, I ain't eating here. You know, this is right. nasty. Yeah. You know, so then they call and say, hey, we need these things going. And we we, we basically just round them up like you do geese. Um, turns out that ducks are not all that brilliant, especially <laughs> the, the Muscovy ducks. <laughs> so they, they are don't very fly? fast. They don't yes, fly? They can, they they can fly. fly. Okay. But they're, they're a pretty weighted bird. They, yeah. they're, they fly, I would say, in a lazy manner. All right. So if they can fly 10 feet and then drop back down and just stare at you again, that's what they're going to do. I gotcha. Okay. Um, you know, if they, they just get out of danger and then they they go back down. Cause I mean, like I said, they're a weighted bird. So sure. they're not, they're not going great, great distances around here. They're, they're so happy to eat French fries. You know, like they fill up on <laughs> 30 pounds of French fries. But do you but, net them? Do you try to no, we do them into it, a just trap? Like you would do. Yeah, basically, um, we just do it like we do a goose roundup. We have a little okay. box pen, all right. Um, two little open wings, and you run them down that chute, and then they they get in there, and they turn around and go, "Oh crap, I'm caught," you know. Oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> and so then you just pick them up and put them in a cage. You know? So they don't need they need a little bit of room distance in order to get lift. They can't. In other words, if they come up against the wall, they can't just start. Well, flying. I They've always gotta... put a I always put a top on it. Put a top. I always. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's always got. It's basically, uh, you know, that orange fencing with uh, yeah. PVC tubing. Just build okay. some, you know, build a little fort basically with so one you, open end. And you slow walk them. Is that it? So they don't yes. fly. You yeah. just slow walk them. Just slow walk them in. That's because, like I said, if they think you got a French fry, they'll come up to you. You know, ah, so you okay. can actually throw a bunch of fries in there, and they're gonna if they see you're getting fed. But it's far easier just to get a couple guys and just slow walk them over there and get them in there. Yeah, so just a warning to everyone here so that Muscovy ducks are not considered a native species in most, if not all, of America. I do I do recall reading somewhere that there were a couple isolated areas where they were treated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as native. Always check your laws. We've got to make sure we have that legal stuff in here so we know people screaming at me later. Right, you're right, telling right. people to break the law. Always follow because you may have federal law and there may be local protection, right? So make sure you get your ducks in a row, figuratively <laughs> speaking here, <laughs> pun intended, of course, we'll say. But, uh, but but I guess you just do a little slow walk roundup, which is kind of neat. Yeah, you, you have to understand. I mean, we're doing this for a very specific reason, not because we yeah. just don't like ducks. I mean, sure. there's a health concern in a food establishment, you know, something like that. Um, you're, that's why we're doing it. Interesting. All right. Well, that's pretty fast. A any trapping or you just always just slow walk them? Just slow walk them in. Just I mean, uh, so far, I've actually caught one in a raccoon trap, I guess okay. you would call it, you know, yeah. the, just a cage, typical cage trap. I have a heart, you know, yeah. um, you put some seed in there. Like I said, the birds are not, they're so concerned with eating, you know, kind of <laughs> like you talk about geese and you say <laughs> they've got what you call mental inertia. Okay. You know, they, they want to go in a certain direction and that's right. what they're going to do. Gotcha. Um, so right. uh, they'll go in it, but the slow walk them in is the easiest way. I like that mental inertia. That's a, that's our word for today. Mental. Yeah. Inertia. That's my, that's my very expensive word. I like that. I like that a lot. All right. How about armadillo? Let's talk about armadillos a little bit. Now there's some mental inertia. Okay. Um, I, I like to call them little bulldogs. All right. Um, they are bulldozers. They're pretty strong animal. Um, as you know, they they uh, they go by smell. They don't they don't have very good eyesight. Um, so anytime we're trapping those, it's basically just tricking them into walking into the trap. Okay. Um, put it in the path they're going to take anyway. Do you wing them? Do you put wings on? Uh, it depends. You okay. know, a lot. Of, I'll try to use the natural structures that are already there. Okay. Like I just said, so. I try to place the traps in an area that they're already traveling. Okay. That makes it much quicker. Now, if in the case of where there's a burrow underneath of a slab, that's their hole. They're in there. You just put the trap in front of the hole. You're going to capture them. But you have to have a decent trap, you know, like a Comstock. Uh, they're okay. really excellent traps. They're, they're meant to hold that type of animal. Yeah, Comstocks um, but, are incredible. So you like two-door traps. You like the blind sets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
All right. Interesting. So you have to have a tray. You can't just get one of those. Um, well, well, like I said cheap, earlier, cheap I, traps. You got to want to want to get the one that's one to ha have one by half inch weave and some really good. You know, ribbing. a lot of people, a lot of people kind of dog the the typical have a heart cage that you might find at Home Depot. Okay, they will hold an armadillo, medium to small. The yeah. larger ones, they will not hold them. They will break the door straight through. I've got okay. plenty of pictures of traps that are, you know, bent up because of it. Wow. Uh, but but you can definitely it, they'll hold them. Okay. You know, but not every time. I mean, if you really, the Comstock traps are, they're going to hold them every single time. And how I about mean, the professional versions of, because I think Woodstream yeah, has the, a professional version, Tomahawk yeah, has a professional Tomahawk, version. Tomahawk, you know, uh, yeah, your, your pro-grade traps, basically, okay. if you're spending, you know, the Havahars run about, let's say, $50, right? Okay. They're a great trap. I mean, tried and true method, kind of like, you know, your Victor rat trap. They've been around forever. Yeah. But if you really want, you know, a solid trap, a professional grade trap, then you're going to want to go with Tomahawk, you know, a safeguard, something like that. And, and everybody has their preference. Okay. And we try to tailor the trap to the animal. Yeah. Right. You know, it, you're just not going to put the, the, like the traps that you might buy at tractor supply. I don't, I don't want to put them down because they have their use too, mm -hmm. but they're certainly not, you know, they're, they're not meant for armadillos. That's for sure. <laughs> and I don't yeah. plow through that thing in five seconds flat, you know, gotcha. oh, they're very, very, you know, they're very powerful diggers. And yeah. Now have you found though, there's been a lot of work done on trying to find the magic bait for armadillos. Well, have you, have you, have you found it? You know, do you remember the name Tim Julian? Yeah. He was the founder. So, yeah, I yeah. remember him. Oh, sure. He passed away, what, four or five years ago? It's been a while. Six, yeah, maybe six. Well, you know, he had his own line of lures and baits and things Pro like line, that. I think it was. Yeah. Yep. And yep. I went to his house one time and, and he said, hey, man, I'm working on this armadillo bait. He said, I got one problem. We don't have armadillos around here. Hmm. So it's really difficult to test. So can I send you some stuff and you test it for me. And I did that and nothing ever worked, <laughs> but yeah. he sure tried, you know, yeah, um, no. everybody says earthworms. And so, man, he was trying that. I, I noticed that um, armadillos, they say can sense the vibrations of termites underground. Okay. okay. I don't remember where I read it, but I've, I've read it in more than one place. Um, and I got to thinking that, and I, I usually, when I'm looking at armadillo damage, it's either on an anthill yeah. or, a ter or a t in an old dead tree where there's termites. Mm -hmm. So they're obviously drawn to something there, right? right. They can't see. So it's got to be something. I mean, uh, is it a, an odor that they put off, a ferrome? Right. We don't know. Or a so sound. We tried to, yeah, or, or is it a sound? Sound. And so people have said, oh, well, you know, just use earthworms. That works for me. Mm. And it, it, well, you know, I had a guy that got rid of bats from his house by using holy water, right? And so I, the okay. bats were gone, right? The bats right. were gone. So how do you argue with that, right? Right. So I, I tried to tell him that that doesn't work, but the bats were gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so along that same lines, you know, all these things, ideas for baits, I mean, truly at this point, we still don't really know, but we do know that if you get an armadillo in a cage, and it pees in that cage that you can pretty much set that cage anywhere and another armadillo will go in there. Does it have right? to be so a female? Any, any, any urine? I don't know. Okay. I'm not, not a hundred percent sure on that. Gotcha. You know, that would be, there's a, there's a guy, I think he's trying to corner the market on selling wooden, you know, traps that are pre-scented. Um, and I don't know if he's using a female or a male or whatever, but I mean, if it's like any other species, you know, um, you put the, uh, let's say you have a trap with a rag in it that a male squirrel has been peeing on. You take that thing to another job. They, the squirrels ain't going in there. Right, He's too right. dominant. They'll smell that. But you put a female in, urine in there, whole different ball of, you know, ball sure. of wax that you're going to get a lot of males checking that trap out. Fascinating. So, yeah. So if it follows suit, I would think you would probably want to get urine from a female. So I would, that. I would think it'd be kind of neat. And I, I think that would be really cool if someone, w someone would try that out. I think the other thing is I'm, I'm fascinated by the possibility that it's the, the sound of 
termites. Well, that's what I was ants. starting to say about the uh, earthworms in the container. That right? there's noise that's being made. They're motion. I think they're, th they're moving. So if it's a styrofoam container, you know, just if you've ever been in an attic that has foam in there, you know that the foam reverberates that noise. It, you know, it really amplifies it. Yeah. So if they're moving around that container, they may be making some sort of sound that's attracting the armadillo. But again, you know, this is all speculation. Sure. Well, we got the only way to find out because they've tried so many lures. I'm referring to the article that was done out of the University of Georgia that tried a bunch of baits and all of them failed miserably. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the first study. There were others before that. And so now I'm wondering if there's a either you know, the urine thing, I, th I think is was wasn't hasn't been tried yet and that, that I'm aware of. And certainly the sound issue has not been tried yet that I'm aware of. Right. And, and so, that, that may be the breakthrough that somebody needs to come up with. Some. I've I've thought about it myself. Like what you know, if I invented it, would I be famous, you know, for inventing I, it? I think you um, would. I think the we with the micro technology and with your with your computer type and engineering skills. I don't know why you don't try it. Something because there are squeakers for for cats now. Right. Why couldn't there be something that would have some sound from a termite well, movement or whatever? I'll tell you, I, I remember uh, two two different times when I was just amazed at something I tried that worked almost instantly, and it was it, but it wasn't repeatable. Kind of like the holy water thing. Okay. I took uh, there's a there's a bait called honey gland. All right. I th I think I think that's one of Rob Erickson's baits. Could be. That, I think so. Anyway, um, this honey gland, I, I uh, dipped some of it in a, uh, uh, some uh, debris that was on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I dipped it in there and I put it in the trap. Now it has a very, if you know that, that bait, it's got a pretty strong smell. Uh, it would have what you call a, a, a good distance on the calling of the smell, right? So an animal can smell that right away. So I put it in the trap. I walked around the other side of the house, set a trap down, and I heard the door close. And I thought, well, that's good. This is 2.30 in the afternoon. Wow. Right? I said, so my immediate thought was uh, the, the doggone door fell. You right. Know? So I come around. Sure enough, there was an armadillo in it. And I went, wow, what did I just do? Did I just invent the magic bait? <laughs> you know, is this all it took? <laughs> you know? And, and so I said, man, I'm going to try this again, you know? So I tried it on a bunch of jobs, and I never had that success again. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> And then there was another time uh, I was drinking a blue power aid on the job, you know, yeah. so I was thirsty. It was hot. And so, you know, they, they say that some of the supposed baits you can try are fruit, rotten mm -hmm. fruit, rotten things fruit. like that. Yep. So I was drinking that and I thought, boy, this smells terrible, you know, rotten fruit. It's a fruit punch. So I poured that in there. I had one in the next day that he, to get in the trap, he had to jump over bricks to get there. Wow. All right. So armadillos are not really, they can climb. They, they, they have that capacity, but their inclination is, you know, on ground. They're just sure. going to travel on foot. They're not going to be climbing up things. So he had literally had to climb over like a stack of three bricks to get in that cage. No kidding. Yeah. Well, but again, it was not repeatable. Not repeatable. Well, and just a warning to everyone, not everyone, not every state allows sound to be used to capture all animals. So make sure you check your wildlife regs before you start experimenting with some sound. So this is why we need comprehensive regulation change for a lot of wildlife control operators, because a lot of the laws that we're under, regulations we're under, are designed for sportsmen and for fur right. trappers, where a fair chase is part of the deal. And, and it really hamstrings our industry in a lot of ways. But that's the subject for another podcast yeah. that, I've, that I've given already. Uh, well, how about nu Nutria? So what do you what do you do for those? Do you just treat them like muskrat, big muskrats or... Well, you know, since I've never trapped a muskrat, I wouldn't know. Okay. But All I right. do know, uh, you know, I, I know what I know. I don't yep. know everything. Sure. Um, I've trapped Nutria uh, for the city. Uh, this has gone back a number of years, but it's a very small pond. Um, it was, I think, 97 of them in two weeks. Wow. And literally the community, the, it, it was in a little park and there's a sidewalk that people would walk their dogs and ride their bikes and, you know, it's a little community area. Yeah. And you literally could not walk anywhere without stepping in Nutria poop. It wow. was the, the little pond was completely greened out. Like there was so much algae, so much bacteria in there that it was starting to stink. 
Um, it was just a really bad situation. There were just too many of them. This, you know, you talk about overabundance, right? Mm. Sociological or is it really biological? Right? Yeah. I think this we were really entering into biological overabundance. They would have starved out. So what were they feeding? How were they able to? What were they eating then? It, well, they eat vegetation. Yeah. So you know, and and this pond had plenty of vegetation around the edges. Um, I, I don't think they were starving. And then it, they had a, a waterway that connected to the lake. Okay. So they could go out anywhere from there. And this was home base where you, you raise your young and, yeah. you know, you're safe in there from everybody else out in the lake. Were you, of course, were they getting collapsed? Were they collapsing the banks from their burrows? Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So they, and they had a little bridge to go across the thing and the, <laughs> the, the ground was so pulled away from it. You were looking at the footings that should have been in the ground. Oh my goodness. Right? Yeah. 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 It was pretty bad. And so there was a lot of them there it definitely went unchecked for a long time, but uh, you know, trapping them in my opinion, when I first started doing it, I knew nothing uh, like, like anything else I've, I've tried. Um, <laughs> and I, I really wasn't sure because, you know, when you, when you think about nutria or muskrat generally, there's not, they don't teach that in school trapping, right. Or right. getting rid of those animals. It's not something that they teach anymore. Right. And, right. and your granddad doesn't fur trap anymore. Uh, there's a lot of that is just going with the past. The fur trapping industry is really dwindling. And so when you think about that type of animal uh, that was for, you know, fur trapping at one point, you say, well, okay, how do I handle these things? Do I go out and get these conibears? Do I get these footholds? Well, this is a park. Right. So you've got kids, you've got dogs, you've got cats, you've got ducks. Um, in my opinion, cona bears were out of the question. Okay. You know, there was no way in the world I, I would want that. Um, so we were able to use cage traps in there. Okay. Um, and this is where the cheaper traps are awesome mm -hmm. because you want a lot of traps. So if you, you know, there's a supplier that sells a, a very cheap cage trap large enough to house the nutria and a smaller trap actually comes with it. And the whole deal was like 25 bucks. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I can get, you know, four traps for a hundred dollars or, you know, instead of two. So you right? can do what, a seven by seven with, with a 10. No, by this 12. is like a, this is like a raccoon size cage. Yeah. But wasn't there a 10 by yeah, 12? And then, yes. And, yes. Then, and, and then, then a seven the by seven. And, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're green, you know, they're mm -hmm. wire, powder coated or whatever yep. you want to call it. But um, like I said, because they're so cheap and, and the funny thing about Nutria is they're a very big animal or can grow to be pretty big and pretty yeah. strong. Right. And, and at least in my area. Now I have heard other people say, Oh no, I've had them bust my doors down. I've never had them bust a door. They literally just sit there and look at you. Um, the, at least. So I haven't had that experience. Um, basically put some sweet potatoes out there and, I like to refer to them as hogs, just yeah. little pigs. They, they just, if you put 700 pounds of uh, <laughs> sweet potatoes out, I guarantee you they're going to try and eat every bit of it before they go to bed that night. Like they right. just, whatever we put out was completely gone. So do, you, do they need eye appeal or was it just, you had the location and just toss a sweet potato in the back and you're good to go? Well, so basically I would just shave off some, um, uh, some pieces out in front of the cage and then okay. I would take the sweet potato and I put it on the top of the cage over the trip pan yeah. and basically use the cage like a cheese grater gotcha. and just grind the stuff onto the pan. Gotcha. And man, it, it just, next day you're going to have a nutria yeah. in there. Do you think the reason why you didn't have any trouble with nutria breaking out is because you were checking because such a high location, high um, visitation location, you were actually, of uh, checking your traps every day. And so you weren't leaving them. Well, that's required. Days. No, that's required by law on any job anyway. Sure. But you know that some people don't I'm always. I'm sure it happens. <laughs> <laughs> aren't, aren't as careful as they you should You know, be. unfortunately, like the reality for a lot of people is you, you can't possibly be in 12 places at the same time. Right. You just right. can't. And that's why we have the, the cellular cameras now that allow us to see the, you know, actually visually look at it from a distance, mm -hmm. you know. They're super important to, to be in, uh, successful in this now. Gotcha. So you didn't float any of your traps out into the water? You just did it all in the bank? Well, I, I got the bright idea to take a piece of plywood yeah. and put some traps on it. 
attached the traps. I tied a rope to the piece of plywood and I floated it out to the middle. And then I came back the next day and it was all, it appeared to be gone. And I thought, wow, somebody actually stole that. I was like, who <laughs> in, in the world would go out here and steal this? And come to find out, I didn't account for the weight. Yes. So the... <laughs> When, so they, when the traps filled up, they drowned themselves. Yes. Um, I, you know, I really felt bad about that. I don't, you know, we're not allowed to relocate them anyway. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you're going to, if you have to kill an animal, you should do it, you know, in a humane method. And I, I just did not think that was right. You know, okay. I think the term humane really is, uh, you know, it's personal at best. Okay. For the definition of it. So you were you just didn't want to drown him at that particular point. You wanted to yeah, like, carbon you know, dioxide him. Well, like I said too, you got to, this is a public park. Yeah. Um, you know, I, there had to have been a point where they were bobbing. <laughs> yes. I, and you, you know, a little mean? bit of and, flutter of the water there as they're struggling. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know, I could just I just could imagine a you know a kid's horror as they're like, oh my, God. you know, look at the animal. Oh, what's happening? You know. I, I just didn't think that was right. Yeah, you're you're uh, you're absolutely correct. But it, nothing happened, so you're good to go. Uh, so, yeah. without without a doubt. So, well, that's a fascinating uh, thing. So, did you do any other nutrient nutrient trapping out and some of the canal, canals out there along? No, we don't. the The sheriff's department here uh, shoots them in the canals, um, and there there are certain areas where if the water level rises, they determine that a bullet could ricochet off the water. So yeah. they can't shoot in those areas. And then, so they usually like a neighborhood association called me and said, Hey, the, the police officers cannot shoot in this area. Can you come trap this area? I've done a, but that's not for the city. You know, the city doesn't pay for that. They're right. They'll just skip over that one and, and go on to greener so pastures. You would think that flooding would be a, a big worry with nu Nutria going after your dikes. Well, no, not really. I mean, honestly, they do cause damage to the edges. Um, and they certainly, I think if left unchecked, like around that, that little pond, yeah, they can cause a problem. But for the most part, like, I, I just don't, I, I don't see them causing a lot of damage. Like what, you know, is like, it's hyped up to be. Gotcha. Now I can yeah. see the ricochet problem with a rifle, with a rifled bullet, but why would there be a ricochet problem with a shotgun? Let's say if they were shotgunning the, um the you know they i don't know exactly what their their policies and procedures gotcha. are i mean you know you have to remember we're not talking about coastal wetland damage yeah what because i don't i don't deal with that i'm dealing strictly with urban urban things, area okay right and so i don't you know there's just i don't really know what their policies are on shooting in the canals and things like that but i think as long as the shot is a downward shot yeah. they can take it but if it if they have to raise the gun to a certain level it's they're not allowed not allowed to do it well that makes that certainly makes right. sense right. well anything uh anything else about your work down there in louisiana you've had 20 years of experience you've seen an obviously an enormous amount of change within this industry how have you changed in your own business practices over the last 20 years what's been the biggest change for you uh i would say trying to work smarter um trying to target what's important to my business and how we make money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, I think that's an important thing that a lot of guys overlook, you know, you just can't do it all. Right. Um, you know, w when I first started developing the software, I put a lot of hours into it and I feel like my business might've suffered during that time because you just become obsessed with just getting this perfect or doing this. You spend time doing that while well, you're not working on your, your business income. Right, right. Right. So you have to learn to divide your time. And so when you're talking about a wildlife control business, no matter where you're at in the country, you have to learn to divide your time if and, and look at your company and say, well, what works for us and what doesn't? You know what? What are you have to really take an honest look and maybe even ask your guys, like, what do we do well? What what don't we do well? Like, what is the worst thing? Like I, I asked my my nephew who works for me, I said, what is it you hate? You know, what is the worst job I could give you? And you say, oh, it's putting a lattice under a house. Okay, well, maybe we shouldn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Because I notice, you know, just over time that when he's doing those jobs, they seem to take forever. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and so yeah. well, 
I wonder why, right? Wonder because why. he does, his heart's not in it. He doesn't want to do it. So, yeah. you know, when I'm supposed to go out there and beat him, you know, make him work harder, sure. um, it's just not going to happen. So it's like, well, if that's not profitable, we're wasting time doing that. He doesn't like doing it. Why don't we concentrate our efforts on things that he does like, mm. um, things that are more profitable for the company, you know, like what species, and that's how my software kind of comes into play too. I say, well, what species do is the most profitable that we're doing? Um, a lot of guys say, oh, it's got to be bats. Well, maybe not. You know, if right. you're if you're closing up a house for bats and you, somebody calls about squirrels, that's a bat job, too, in a sense, because mm -hmm. you're sealing up the house no matter what job it is. Yeah. So you really got to think about that into what, you know, do we want to get into doing roofing work, you know, um, or putting drip edge for rodents? Or do we want to sub that out? Like, yeah. look at what is actually profitable for you and what can be subbed out you you know if you got a, a crew that's a, a roofing company that you can hire to do the work why go out and do it yeah you can hire them to do it you know so you, that's really that's over the years i've tried to learn well try to stay in your lane mm -hmm. you know yeah i think go deeper how how have you found like with your with with your work, you don't really get into any of the pest, pesticide stuff, right? Do you do any toxicants for rodent rodenticides? No, 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 no. So you've totally like stayed away of out of the pest. Control yeah, side. so we do. Yeah, and so I've got some pretty good relationships with local pest control companies. Mm. Be more than happy to give you their number, and you know, I think I can do the trapping here. I can do the repair work, but if you're worried about you know uh, new ones, new animals coming into the area, yeah. Can, you should probably have bait stations around your house. Contact your pest control company, and that's my recommendation. And then they can take it from there. So, why did you never get into the rodenticide portion of pest control? Well, so in Louisiana, you know, you've you've got to have a degree, or you have to work for someone for a couple of years. Ah, uh, okay. I've come to learn that I'm not real smart. Okay. Okay. I say that. It, I, I'm not trying to dog myself. It's just that I know what I know. There are certain things I know very well, but when it comes to learning uh, uh, something new, I, I struggle. I have to really study that. All and right. so, you know, I'm not a really good test taker, but like I said, I know what I know. Doctors who went to school for many years hire me because they don't know what I know. Gotcha. Right? So I think going to school now to try and become a, uh, insectologist. It's just not something I'm going to do. Gotcha. Okay. Well, any uh, closing remarks you'd want to leave with our audience here before we, uh, before we wrap it up? Uh, well, if, if you thought I was helpful, I also do training for NACOA. Um, I put together some of the training courses there and if I've been helpful to you at all, maybe you should check those out. Okay. Well, thanks, Charles. So I just want to close up here together, everybody. So again, my name is Stephen Van Tassel. I'm the host here of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. We want you to take a few moments and subscribe to our podcast. Drop me a line. Tell me what you like, what you didn't like about our podcast. We hope that if you have ideas for what you'd like to have us cover in the future, definitely drop me a line. Where would you do that? Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. That's Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com com and definitely we'd love to hear from you well charles we really appreciate you being on the show let me give you a final plug uh, it's charles parker everyone owner of parker wildlife control and nuco pro software from louisiana out there down there in new orleans and we talked about muscovy ducks and armadillo and nutrient and of course nuco pro software and you can learn more about that at nucopro.com that's n-w-c-o-p-r-o Dot com nucopro.com he would love to hear from you and tell him you heard us from living the wildlife podcast and remember everyone we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife <laughs> take care everybody thanks dude this is the disclaimer for wildlife control consultant and pest geek podcast with living the wildlife podcast always follow national state provincial and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. <laughs>